Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Freshwater Stewardship Community webinar series. We're quite excited to have Cole Blair with us from the Wildlife Preservation Canada organization. My name is Monica Seidel, and I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager at Watersheds Canada. And I have my coworker with me in the kind of tech side of Zoom today. Her name is Nicole, and she will be dropping a whole bunch of things in the chat for you today, as well as helping with any tech issues. So if you're having trouble hearing things, or you have maybe a question for the Q&A at the end of today's session, but you would like to submit it privately, you can private message her through Zoom to do so. As many of you know, probably having attended many of these webinars, I work in an organization called Varshets Canada. We're a national charity that is headquartered in Eastern Ontario, and we deliver national programs that focus on freshwater stewardship and education, including some habitat restoration programs. And so I wanted to go a little bit different with how I explain our organization with a quick case study and talk about some of the habitat restoration work that we do. So one of the really lovely things about habitat restoration work is that it's really clear to see the before and after impact when the community comes together. So here we have an example from one of our fish projects, and this is a brush bundle. You might also see it called in water woody debris. And what we're doing is creating these brush piles on land to later be deployed into the water so that we can restore in water structures for the fish to be able to hide and feed and spawn and also get shelter from the sun. So we work with community groups, shoreline property owners, anglers, students to be able to build these bundles and then we work to deploy them. And so we go to different spots around the lake that are either in back bays or really deep areas that won't be a hazard to boat traffic. And we're able to put these woody debris structures back in. And often these areas are cleaned up because people are looking for a clean aesthetic with their lakes. And so they don't want to have anything that they might swim across or for their boats to get like snagged on. And so they'll clean up these areas, not realizing that it's really valuable fish habitat. And so we're able to work with these groups and strategically place these brush bundles to be able to restore this really important habitat for the fish species. So now we can see the brush bundle is getting deployed, it's going back into its new home where different species will be able to use it. And then we go back with all of our habitat restoration projects. We go back a few years later to see how the habitat is doing, whether it's being used by different species, and so it might be a little hard to see in this bottom corner photo here, but there are many different fish species using the brush pile. And so this is really great news for the lake community as a whole and also for the aquatic species on that lake. So this is just one example of the types of projects that we do. This is a really a visual project, which is nice for a medium like a webinar to explain some of the freshwater stewardship work that we do. And if you are interested in learning more about our other programs, um, some of which we'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but you can learn about them at watersheds.ca forward slash r hyphen work. And something that's nice about these brush piles is that we can also get larger fish species. So here we have some bass. Again, might be a little hard to see on the screen. We have two very nice bass in the middle. So we're attracting all different types of fish species to these brush bundles, which is really great to see. On that note, we are looking for groups across Central Ontario right now to help with doing woody debris projects. So if you are a member of a lake association, a hunting and angling group, maybe you're part of a property owners association, and you think that your lake could benefit from more in water woody debris structures, we would invite you to fill in a short form an interest form and see if you might be a good fit for project delivery either later this year or next year. And Nicole is going to drop in the chat the link for this partner form request. And you can get in contact with Melissa, who is our Habitat and Stewardship Program Manager, and see if this might be a project that is a good fit for your lake. Another way that you can help protect fish habitats, though from the land, is by restoring a shoreline property. So if you are someone who is a waterfront property owner or you know someone who is a waterfront property owner and they could benefit from restoring their shoreline with native plants, 
we are offering starter kits for property owners across central eastern Ontario. That's for us personally and our staff team, though we do have partners across Canada who deliver our Natural Edge restoration program. And so you can email naturaledge at watersheds.ca, even if you live outside of central eastern Ontario, and we will be able to connect you with different regional groups across the country who deliver this program and we'll be able to do a site visit with you on your property and then also go through with planting if you are interested. So if you email naturaledge at watersheds.ca, you'll get in touch with Chantel and then she'll be able to help you with your next steps for a possible restoration program. If you're maybe not at that step, or maybe you don't have Shoreline property, but you are looking to make a difference on your property in the city or just somewhere that's not right along the water, we have a number of resources on our website that are all free that would help you see how you can create different wildlife habitat, whether you're looking to benefit pollinator species, birds, different mammals. Um, there are lots of different resources on our website that you can use. So you can find all of them for free download at watersheds.ca slash our hyphen work slash resources. And again, Nicole will put that link in the chat. Another way that you can help our work and help different freshwater species thrive is by making symbolic adoptions. So we have a number of Canadian artists that have put together these different postcards. So they feature different native species that benefit from the restoration programs that Watersheds Canada delivers. And so we have these five by seven postcards that you can give as a gift or you can frame and keep yourself as well as a different honor card that comes with each of these that you can personalize if you choose to give it as a gift. So we have uh, over 20 adoptions available on our website and all of them are eligible for a Canadian tax receipt. So if you are interested in getting started on some birthday shopping, Mother's Day and Father's Day shopping, or just want some beautiful artwork done by Canadian artists, you can find some different options at watersheds.ca slash gifts. And then, of course, today we're here for the Freshwater Stewardship Community, which is our online program that launched in 2021. We have a very large library of resources, so webinar recordings and handouts that can be found on our website, range from a variety of speakers from the nonprofit sector, private consultation, businesses, conservation authorities, government, research, which tried to cover many different topics over the years. And so if you're newer to this community, or maybe you just want to look back and see what else has been explored, you can do so by visiting watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship to access all of those free resources. It's been pretty neat to see how the freshwater stewardship community has grown over the last few years. So we have hosted 46 webinars and they have been viewed by over 9,500 people in 17 countries. So the map that you can see on the screen is where everyone has registered from. So you can see largely it is in Canada and the States, but it has somehow popped up in countries around the world, which is just great to see that people are accessing these free resources and looking to take action for their local freshwater areas and the species that live there. And we're finishing up our spring webinar series with two more webinars. So we have one happening on Monday, April 1st, and then we have one the following week, April 11th. So both of these are looking at things that are likely to happen around springtime. Um, so looking at flood impact maps and how different models can predict what is going to be happening in different parts of Canada with uh, different spring trends that we're seeing. And then as we look ahead to spring migration for our bird species, how we're able to have kinder choices for them so that they're able to complete their migration successfully. So for those of you on the call today, when you went to our freshwater stewardship community page, you would have registered for today's session. And then if you just scroll down a tiny bit on that site, you will be able to register for these two webinars as well. And Nicole will also drop the link in the chat if you are interested in attending either of these sessions. But for today, we have Cole Blair here with us from Wildlife Preservation Canada. So Cole's time with Wildlife Preservation Canada began as a graduate student at the University of Toronto, where he researched harmful parasites and bumblebees. 
and he looked at a lot of bee poop, which he told me a little bit ago he is going to talk about today as well, which I am looking forward to. He has since been playing a supporting role as a technician in both the field and in their bumblebee conservation breeding lab. So he is now the Ontario program coordinator and Cole hopes to demonstrate to others that any conservation engagement, no matter how big or small, can go a long way. So with that, I'm gonna pass things over to you, Cole. Excellent, thank you, Monica. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Oh, everybody can see my title slide here. Excellent, so again, hi everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you to Watersheds Canada for hosting. Uh, my name is Cole Blair. I'm the Ontario Program Coordinator for Wildlife Preservation Canada's Native Pollinator Initiative, and I'm here to be discussing bumblebees with you all. So we'll be going over some general bee knowledge, uh, bumblebee biology, and also the conservation efforts we engage in, uh, including what you can do to help out our pollinator pals. But before I jump right into it, I do want to give a brief land acknowledgement. Wildlife Preservation Canada is headquartered in Guelph, Ontario, on the homelands of many nations, including the Anishinaabek, the Neutral, Métis, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We work across Turtle Island and have a deep gratitude to all the Indigenous peoples who have been and continue to be stewards and protectors on the lands on which we lie. A little bit more background about us at Wildlife Preservation Canada. We're a nonprofit with the mission to save animal species that are at risk of extinction or are declining. We have several programs working with animals that are declining both in Ontario and over in BC. So we work with pollinators like butterflies and bumblebees, but we also work with frogs, turtles, birds, and snakes. Within Wildlife Preservation Canada, we have the Native Pollinator Initiative, which we launched in 2013. And since then, we've been collaborating with numerous partners in Canada and also internationally to develop and maintain a variety of native pollinator conservation projects. On the butterfly front, our Taylor's Chucker Spot Butterfly Program over in British Columbia consists primarily of a conservation breeding program. And this program has been seeing successful releases now since 2015. Excitingly, this was a species that was once thought to be extirpated, but has now recently been rediscovered recently on Denman Island where these releases have been occurring. It has now also been uh, discovered nearby thanks to the ongoing efforts of our teams and our colleagues. In Ontario, we're now part of a group devoted to the recovery and reintroduction of the model dusky wing, which is endangered both provincially and federally. The reintroductions have been ongoing for the past few years now over at Pioneer Provincial Park in Grand Bend. On the bumblebee side of things, um, our work is mostly in Ontario with some previous work in Alberta. And while uh, the majority of our efforts are broadly applicable across all bumblebee species, two of our primary targets are the yellow banded bumblebee here on the left, both in Ontario and Alberta, and the Western bumblebee on the right over in Alberta. These are both federally listed species. Before I jump straight into bumblebees, I do wanna to touch briefly on bees in general, specifically the immense diversity in the bee world. So when we think about bees, we often think about bumblebees or the big hairy, uh, or, or the honeybees, sorry, or big hairy bumblebees. But the reality is that there are many, many more kinds of bees. And in fact, every bee here on this collage are just some representatives of the different bees we have around the world. These are all different species. Bumblebees are found across the globe on all continents, except Antarctica. There are so many bees, in fact, more than 20,000 in the world, including more than 4,000 in North America, more than 800 in Canada, and over 400 only in Ontario. Most of these native bees are solitary, meaning that these bees live alone, although they can nest in a small community of sorts. The only true example of social bees that we have are our bumblebees, which are native, and our honeybees, which uh, are non-native. We brought those over from Europe. And among these solitary groupings, we have things like carpenter bees, leafcutter bees, mining bees, and cellophane bees, and many, many others. And just to iterate how rare sociality is among bees, there are actually more parasitic species of bees, meaning there are more species that go around and steal resources from other bees than there are social bees. So this is pretty different than what most people think about when we think about bees. Social bees, as we know, have colonies where many individuals work together to forage and guard and these colonies have a designated queen that will lay eggs. Honeybees are a great example of social bees as they're able to create impressive colonies as large as 50,000 individuals. However, as I said, these bees are non-native. The only native bee uh, that we have in, on in Canada, sorry, that is truly social are bumblebees of which we have 46 different species. And this 46 species figure is only representative of about 6% of our native bees in North America. All our other bees are primarily solitary. Some of these solitary groups are mildly social where egg laying females might work cooperatively with each other 
or having teeny tiny colonies of around three to 10 individuals, but nothing nearly on the scale of honeybees or bumblebees. These solitary groups can vary in size, shapes, and colors as we see here, but one of the best ways for us to group them are based on common traits like nesting preferences. Just to reiterate, most diversity of our bees are in uh, solitary bees, really the only social bee that we have that's native are bumblebees. But so now into more about bumblebees specifically. I did mention that we have around 46 species in Canada. We can differentiate these, we can differentiate these species by color, their size, their tongue length, and of course their geographic distribution. So here on screen, we have some artistic illustrations of real Canadian species, and we can see a variety of patterns of black, yellow, orange, and even some white. Some species, as I'm sure you've noticed, have similar patterns to others. I did mention tongue length as a differentiator between species. Most people aren't aware of this, but the reality is that some species have longer tongues than others, which is important uh, because this impacts what flowers they're able to forage from. So for example, a flower like honeysuckle has very deep flowers. A short tongue species might not be as successful in foraging from this compared to a species with a longer tongue. So there's some evolutionary and ecological relevance to the tongue length of bumblebees in addition to just their morphological characteristics. Bumblebee species can also differentiate in their seasonality with some species emerging earlier in the spring and having longer active times than others. The common Eastern bumblebee is a great example of a early emerging bee that has a very long active time while the species like the northern amber bumblebee emerges quite later in the season and therefore has a shorter active time. Different species of bumblebees can also um, differ in their colony sizes between species with some capable of producing colonies of around a few hundred workers, while others may produce only a few dozen. Now, when I'm familiarizing myself with the morphology of bumblebees, what I like to do is contrast them with honeybees, since this is what most people are familiar with. So on the honeybee side, we see that they're considerably thinner they have narrow abdomen and they're much less hairier. And we can see between these two images that the honeybee is a lot smaller. The bumblebee is of course hairy throughout the entire body and the queens in particular are much larger and bumblebees do have more color variety. In honeybees, um, their colors are orange, yellow or brown around their abdomen, but they can kind of vary. Bumblebees, their colors are derived from their hairs and the uh, patterns on their abdominal and thorax are used to differentiate between species. And as we look at the honeybee here, their body segments are very distinct from each other. So we could tell the head looks a lot different from the thorax, which looks a lot different from the abdomen. Whereas the bumblebee looks more like one single body mass. It's hard to tell when the head starts and the thorax begins. And furthermore, when the thorax ends and the abdomen begins. Socially, honeybees have much larger colonies where the queens live multiple years. Whereas bumblebees have considerably smaller colonies uh, that follow an annual life cycle. And these traits that bumblebees possess uh, make them excellent pollinators suited to their northern climates, which I'll delve into a little bit later. But for now, I want to examine the typical colony cycle of a bumblebee. Like I said, they follow an annual life cycle and will start in the spring, um, since that's what is intuitive and is what we're heading into now being at the end of March. So in the springtime, a queen will wake up from her long winter's nap, which we call hibernation or overwintering. We use those terms relatively interchangeably. And then when she awakens, she'll start to go out and collect food for her colony and look for a spot to uh, initiate her nest. Nesting spots can be made out of anything from small mammal burrows in long tuft grasses and even in man-made objects. Really all they're looking for is a warm, humid space that's protecting them from the outside elements. As we transition into the summertime, hopefully the queen's efforts have started to pay off and we see the emergence of workers in these colonies. So now instead of the queen leaving the nest to go collect food, the workers will take up that and the queen will lay, out, uh, lay back in the colony to lay more eggs and take care of the larva. As we move more into the fall, hopefully the colonies have lots and lots of workers and the queens will now shift gears to reproductive output. So this means that she'll begin prioritizing the production of males and new queens, which we call gynes. And then these males and gynes will disperse away from the colony and reproduce from males and gynes from other colonies of that same species. And then of course, in the winter, these newly mated gynes hibernate underground alone to wake up later in the spring and start the process all over again next year. So the reason we call them annual colonies is because the queens only live for a year. And I want to reiterate that the founding queen that started this all in the last spring, as well as the workers and males that she produced throughout the, um, the active season, they all naturally perish, leaving only the newly produced gynes to overwinter alone. This is a lot uh, different from honeybees, 
where their queens can live for multiple years and their workers can survive throughout the winter. If you're curious to what bumblebee colonies look like, here we have some visuals. The one on the left here uh, is actually a tricolored bumblebee um, from the outside, not necessarily showing the inside, but these are actually guines that are leaving their nest to go and find mates. And on the right, we see uh, what a typical bumblebee nest looks like underground. We see these um, waxy capsule looking things. These are actually egg cells. So they're bumblebee larvae developing in there. We also see, you might see some shimmers in the middle of there of these waxy cells, but with openings on them. And these are actually nectar pots. So that shimmer there is actually the nectar that bees have stored in these waxy containers. So now that we've learned a bit more about bumblebee biology and their colony cycle, why particularly do we in the Native Pollinator Initiative focus so heavily on bumblebees? There are a lot of other species that deserve recognition and uh, assistance. So why bumblebees? The first reason why we focus so heavily on bumblebees is that unfortunately they are threatened globally. It is estimated that around 30% of bumblebee species around the world may be at risk. This is also representative of the situation in North America where we have around 12 or 26% of our species ranging from vulnerable to critically endangered. There is also a big gray area here on the pie chart, which represents a literal gray area. Uh, these species are data deficient. So we truly do not know the actual conservation statuses of these species. So they are difficult and rare to assess and research, unfortunately. Bumblebees are uh, threatened with many stressors including habitat loss and fragmentation due to urbanization and agricultural use. Of course, we know pesticides as a threat to bumblebees. Along the same vein in agriculture, similar to how honeybees are imported into agricultural uh, practices to pollinate their fields, a lot of greenhouses will import commercial bumblebee colonies, particularly the common Eastern bumblebee. So when honeybees and bumblebees are brought into agricultural practices for pollination, a lot of the times what happens is some of these bees escape their captivity and then go on to forage from and interact with flowers outside of the agricultural setting. And this is uh, the issue with this is that a lot of these commercial hives come in possessing parasites and pathogens. So when bees escape and they interact with the outside wild populations, they are introducing these parasites and pathogens to our wild bees. And we refer to this as pathogen spillover. And of course, another known threat to bumblebees is climate change. But not only are bumblebees threatened globally, but this is also the case in Canada. Several Canadian species have been assessed as threatened to some extent with extinction, such as these species depicted here, most of which are listed under Canada's Species at Risk Act. There are, of course, other Canadian bumblebee species that we believe to be declining, but these here are at least those that we are absolutely certain of and those that are recognized as such by our federal conservation legislation. The second reason why we focus so heavily on bumblebees is that they are some of our best pollinators. Bumblebees are considered generalist foragers, meaning that they pollinate a large variety of flowers throughout the entire season. Tied to that is their long colony cycle, which we discussed. So bumblebees are out very early in the spring, they're out late into the fall, and they're also out foraging early and late in the day. They've also co-evolved alongside our native flora, so they are tied pretty tightly to them. For example, what I mean by this, we see on the left here on the top, a bumblebee with low bush blueberry. And low bush blueberry is a species that can only be buzz pollinated as is the case with many other native plants. So there are certain flowers that really, really wanna hang on to their pollen. So they'll keep it very tightly in their flowers. But the bees, of course, they want that pollen. So bumblebees and some other solitary bees, but not honeybees, have evolved this ability to do something called buzz pollination, where they essentially grab onto the flowers really, really, really tight and then they vibrate their flight muscles so fast that the pollen is dislodged from the flower, kind of like salt in a salt shaker. So if you had a greenhouse and you were to grow low bush blueberry or tomatoes or something like that, and you were to install honeybee hives, your greenhouse plants would not be efficiently pollinated. The basic biology of the bumblebee also makes them great pollinators uh, because they are lar uh, very large and hairy. They're able to passively collect a lot of pollen. Uh, moreover, similarly to how we build up a electrical charge on our bodies when we walk around outside, bumblebees build a positive electric charge on their hairy bodies when they fly. This is important because pollen is negatively charged, which makes it very attractive to the bee. So pollen grains are, are stuck more readily all over their big positively charged hairy bodies. And then they're transferred from flower to flower as the bees go from uh, 
flower to flower to uh, forage for pollen and nectar. Their size and dense hair also allows, allows them to forage in low temperatures, which is important for their um, northern climates and also important for early spring and early mornings, and then also late into the fall and late into the evening. So with all this said, I want to discuss a little bit more about what we do uh, to help bumblebees. So in the Native Pollinator Initiative, we have a bumblebee recovery program, uh, which consists of four major components, those being um, community science, education and outreach, which we are contributing to today, and then of course, research and monitoring and conservation breeding. And I wanna start with conservation breeding because many of our main objectives in the bumblebee recovery program are derived from our breeding lab. And I love talking about our breeding lab because there's so much different cool work going on. Our lab is actually a, a trailer. Uh, you can see there on the top left at African Lion Safari. So if you're visiting the park this summer, you might spot us uh, between the birds of prey area and the elephants. We got a big banner there and some signage. We give daily Q and A style talks uh, every day in the summer. So if you're around, feel free uh, to stop by and try and uh, attend those if you want to. In the lab, we've been focusing on breeding the yellow banded bumblebee, which we can see here on the left. Uh, the species again is federally listed as uh, special concern. And it is our goal to be able to rear enough generations in the lab to facilitate future releases to bolster the declining wild populations. This species was also chosen because it's related to the endangered rusty patch bumblebee, which hasn't been seen in Canada since 2009. And if we do rediscover this species, we hope that our methods would be transferable to them as well. We also rear the tricolored bumblebee. It is a common species that is related to the yellow banded genetically and phenologically, meaning that they have a similar seasonal timing. So this lets us compare between the two species in our experiments, observing the differences between a, a declining species and a stable species while reducing the number of yellow banded queens that we need to collect from the wild every year, because again, they are a declining species. In our lab, we also conduct a few different studies and experiments to help improve our methods. One of these is a nutritional study looking into the potential for different pollen sources to facilitate colony progression better than others. We've been doing this for a few years, but it's still a mixed bag here. So we are continuing uh, with the hope that further iterations will provide some more concrete results. But another investigation uh, that was alluded to at the beginning here is into the uh, prevalence of certain harmful parasites in these bees pictured here. These are the parasites at 400 times microscopy. So <clears throat> here we have some of the parasite varieties that we're concerned with. These parasites are concentrated in the guts of our bees. So our non-lethaling sampling methods uh, just require a sample of their feces or their poop. So then we'll process these fecal samples and observe them under a microscope. There are, of course, many parasites of bumblebees, but we focus on these two varieties specifically because they have been observed in the literature to facilitate population declines of some species, primarily by impeding the reproductive outputs of the infected bees. So there's a lot of intertwined factors at play here, but generally we understand these um, parasites to uh, have effects like lowering the odds of successful colony initiation, uh, reducing their likelihood to mate, lowering the odds of surviving hibernation, among some others. So again, most of them targeting uh, their reproductive output. So there's still a lot to unravel around these um, parasites and the extent to which they are causing declines in certain species. Just to hammer in how complicated this can be, these particular parasites are present in virtually all bumblebee species globally, but they do not seemingly impact all species equally. So we're still working on this one. We're testing our visual detection methods with genomic analysis in uh, collaboration with some other experts this year. So I'm very excited to see the results of that and hopefully see our methods be validated. And of course, the breeding part of the breeding lab would not be it without the actual breeding. So if you've never seen a bumblebee mate before, this picture here shows just what that looks like. We see the gyne on top uh, vertically. She's just kind of sitting there after accepting the male and while the male kind of hangs off of her rear. Um, you might see here the male has a blotch of white paint on him, and that's because we mark our males and gynes to keep track of what colony they came from, how old they are, what's the health status of their colony, so we can make the best, most optimal pairs to have the most success. So we'll pair these males and gynes in flight cages, then we'll check in with them throughout the day. Um, they're surprisingly picky when it comes to deciding to mate. So it's up to us in the lab to create the conditions that are as comfortable as, uh, for them as possible. This year, we had a lot of incredible success in our breeding lab. Throughout all of the other previous years of us doing this breeding, we never had an observed yellow banded mating. But this year, we had 11, which was a huge boost. 
We also had a lot more males and gynes to work with in our mating trials than in previous years. And this is due to improvements in our husbandry methods leading to greater colony progression and output. So something as simple like changing the ambient temperature or reducing the level of disturbance that is lowering the rate at which we check in on our colonies because when we check in, it's very stressful for the queens. Simple changes like that can make a world of difference. Similarly though, after these gynes are mated, we need to artificially induce overwintering, which simply means we put them in a fridge. So here we have one of our yellow banded gynes taking a little nap in some dirt. So again, we need to create conditions similar to what they choose in the wild, where they would be underground overwintering. So once they're in a the fridge, we would be checking in on them every so often throughout the winter and swapping out the soil for new moist and sterilized dirt. And what's, in, what's very exciting for this season is that we still have mated gynes in the fridge right now that are surviving. So there is the potential for us to have a second generation to work with in the lab for the first time ever. You might have noticed that I did say we collect queens from the wild to uh, import into our breeding lab. And this is where our population monitoring comes in. So every season in the spring, we'll go out and have two teams collect queens and monitor bumblebees. So we'll have a team in Guelph that operates in the Tri-City area and into the GTA. And we'll also have a northern field team in Sudbury, which is critical as many of the declining species like the yellow bandits we work with in the lab have experienced more severe declines in the southern regions of Ontario compared to the northern regions and are therefore more abundant up north. We have an extensive site list that we uh, expand every day. So in an average survey, our site, our crew, sorry, arrive at a site and then focus their attention on any blooming resources. So we, we identify any and all floral resources that are present. So anything that we can see in bloom anything we can identify that has finished blooming and all the flowers that we can identify that have yet to bloom. And identifying all these flowers helps us inform our teams on when to visit certain sites. So for example, at the bottom here, we have willows and willows are one of the first flowers to bloom each spring. So if we know where the willows are, we'll have our teams tackle those sites first. And most of our yellow banded queens are sourced from the Northern team. So that creates the obvious logistical issue of driving them from uh, Sudbury to Cambridge. So we end up just kind of playing some bumblebee queen relay. But once our lab collections are complete, our teams shift focus to surveying sites where other at-risk species or declining species are known or thought to be persisting based on previous year's observations. And then as well, they'll be targeting any long-term sites while also keeping an eye out for adequate sites to add to our growing site list. So another facet of what we do in the Bumblebee Recovery Program, and also something you can get involved in, is our community science initiatives. Community science is a cornerstone of our team's work, and it is also an invaluable tool for conservation. So we at Wildlife Preservation Canada host and assist with several Bumblebee community science programs across the province, and in the past have run programs in Alberta. To prepare for these programs, we hold training workshops where we brief our volunteers on bumblebee biology, how to identify them, and how to survey for and photograph them. These volunteers are critical for bumblebee monitoring as researchers like myself are often limited uh, in their search times by factors like timing, funding, and, and personnel limitations. And it's also a lot of fun to be involved with. And we've received a lot of great feedback from past volunteers, some of whom who have been returning consecutively for years now. It's so much fun to learn about bumblebees and then to go on and observe them in the wild and collect data that meaningfully contributes to their conservation. Some declining species and at-risk species are found during these programs, which is always really exciting for those involved and always really exciting for me who gets to go and verify those identifications by looking at their photos. I keep mentioning photos and photographing these bees are critical since our volunteers will also be uploading these to a, a broader citizen science platform called bumblebeewatch.org, which I'll be elaborating on later. But before I get into that, I do want to briefly touch on the community science programs that we are involved with this coming year. So over in the Grand Bend area, we have our staple program at Pioneer Provincial Park. And at Pioneer, this is our longest running community science program. And this also holds great significance for bumblebees and their conservation as Pioneer is the location where the rusty patch was last observed in Canada back in 2009 and the location where the Ashton Cuckoo bumblebee was last observed in Ontario back in 2008. We also have uh, a couple of programs in the Toronto area that we assist with, including at Claremont Nature Center, hosted by Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and also at Rouge National Urban Park, hosted by Parks Canada. Participation of these programs is totally free. You can find updates on the community science page of our website, but I'll display my email at the end here, so please reach out 
if you're at all interested in participating or if you have any questions. Similarly, we also host annual workshops where we train other organizations in running their own Bumblebee community science programs. We call these the train the trainer workshops. The goals of the train the trainer are to further expand programs of this nature across Canada and by extension, improving the collective survey effort for Bumblebees. We have 2024's train the trainer workshop scheduled for June 17th. It'll be hosted out in Cambridge. The details of this, as well as the online registration and the requirements for hosting a community science program are provided in the webpage displayed here. But of course, again, you can email me for any additional information. So if you're part of a group that would be interested in kickstarting your own Bumblebee program, consider reaching out or coming to train the trainer. Now, I've been mentioning bumblebeewatch.org throughout this presentation, and uh, here we are. If you're familiar with something like iNaturalist, it operates in a very similar way, except it is specific to bumblebees. It launched back in 2014, but has recently relaunched a new version of the website equipped with new and improved features. The background of this is one of the new features being a mapping feature where you can filter different species, different regions, and different uh, factors of time to see what is being observed when and where. This is just one of the new features. It is a very exciting time to check uh, to take a look at the platform. So if you have a picture of a bumblebee, you can submit it here. There are resources to help you take a stab at Bumblebee ID. Here we have uh, what we have on our website. It is a Bumblebee ID card for all of these Southern Ontario species, which is pretty helpful. You can find that on our website where you're free to view and download it. It's handy to have printed or on your phone if you're out actively looking for bees. But Bumblebee Watch also does have their own similar interactive ID guide where you can filter potential species IDs based on the color patterns you're observing in your bees. So you submit your photos, uh, you take a stab at their ID, and then a expert like myself will tell you what species it is. And when you do this, you are helping us help bees. So data on Bumblebee Watch can be used in species assessments, like in the case of the American bumblebee, which is a species at risk, and to also support policies, guide conservation actions, and monitoring species ranges. Species ranges, I wanna to touch on a little bit more because it is uh, something we can actually visualize in Bumblebee Watch. Like I mentioned with the uh, mapping speed, um, the mapping feature that spatializes bee records. So here on the left, we have all of the observations mapped for the common eastern bumblebee, just as an example, as what an expert can use with your data to answer dozens and dozens of questions. So I've gone ahead and shaded over the core range of the common eastern bumblebee, which covers the eastern half of the continental United States and into southeastern Canada. However, you may also notice some blue squares into the prairie provinces and around the Vancouver area. So an expert like myself, if I were investigating something like this and I were taking a look at the map, I might look at this and think, okay, I have the core range here. There might be some expansion of the species into the Midwest and Northern into the prairies, but for sure these dots in Saskatchewan and certainly these, these observations around Vancouver, these are for sure outliers. So I might think, well, we know that the common Eastern bumblebee is used in agriculture around North America, not just throughout the core range. So I might then hypothesize that these uh, observations are sourced from escapees of these greenhouses that went into the wild population and, and started, began to establish themselves. So again, just one uh, cool example of how your data on Bumblebee Watch can help experts with answering tons and tons of questions related to bumblebees including doing the same thing for at-risk species. And one of the greatest parts about Bumblebee Watch is that you don't actually have to be involved with any community science program to contribute. It is totally open to any and all citizens. So let's imagine that you're taking a walk in the summertime or the springtime and you're checking out some flowers and there's bees buzzing around. So you take out your phone, you capture some photos of it, of all the important angles to help us identify them. And then you want to submit them to Bumblebee Watch. It's very easy. So. All you would have to do is check out the uh, website itself. You might have to make a um, profile if you haven't already. And then you would go up to the top where it says add Bumblebee sightings. And then from there, it'll guide you through a very simple process of uploading your Bumblebee data. All you'd really need are your Bumblebee photos, an approximate location, the date you found these bees. And also you could take a stab at the flower that you found it on, but flower ID is pretty tricky. So this part's optional. And I also want to iterate that uh, we try to ask one observation per bee. So if you find multiple bees, you would make multiple observations, each for that, each for a different bee. I have mentioned 
different angles to help us in our IDs. And this is particularly important for lookalike species. One of the best angles that we look for is a side shot of the bee showing the bands of color on the abdomen here and on the thorax. And a side shot can also show a bit of the face to show the color pattern um, there. Lastly, it also lets us observe the leg, which helps us determine males from females. So male bees, unlike workers and queens, males do not have the physical pollen basket used to collect pollen. And that pollen basket on workers and queens gives it a gives their hind legs, sorry, a slightly different shape compared to males. So when you look at the leg, you can tell very easily if this bee is a male or a female. And this is also the same way we can differentiate cuckoo bumblebees, which are parasitic bumblebees from non-cuckoo bumblebee species, because cuckoo bees do not have that pollen basket uh, similar to males. Another angle that we look for is of the back, um, showing the thorax and the abdomen. And if you're able to get a photo with the wings open, like at the bottom there, so that nothing's hidden, that'd be even better. That's just the icing on the cake. The last one, uh, the last angle that's good for ID is a straight shot of the face. The coloration of the face can be important. Here we see this bee has yellow on its face. Other species might have black hairs on its face, but also the facial structures of the bees themselves can be uh, used to differentiate between species. Some lookalike species might have, uh, might have similar color patterns to others, but might have longer cheeks or shorter cheeks. And also some male species have uh, very enlarged eyes compared to others. So not only can it help us differentiate between lookalike species, but can also help us tell what sex this bee is. Photographing bees can be a little tricky, especially if the bees are moving from flower to flower quickly. I just use my phone. I don't have a, a fancy camera to do this with, but some tricks that I employ include a burst fire mode or simply I just take a video of the bee and then I go in and screenshot the good frames. So now that we've gone over bumblebee watching community science, I wanna talk about some individual acts that we can do in our lives to help bees in general. And one of the first that comes to people's mind is to construct their own individual or community pollinator garden, similar to something like this. But pollinator gardens can be any size. They can scale from a window box to an entire field. They don't need to be large. And the reason for this, I think of pollinator gardens as a kind of truck stop for bees. So if you imagine a bee flying around to different parts of the habitat, or sorry, in different parts of a fragmented landscape, especially suburban or urban settings where habitat features are far between, just remember that bees can also get tired, they also get thirsty, and they also get hungry. So having, having even a small patch of flowers in a concrete jungle can help bees with a spot to regain their strength and maybe even forage for more food to bring back with them to their nests. So again, I think of them like a truck stop. What we love to see in pollinator gardens is a season long bloom. So plants that have different blooming times throughout the season. So there's always something there to provide food resources for pollinators during the active season. If your pollinator garden is mainly flowers that bloom in the late summer, that might be great for bees at that time. But if it's lacking early spring flowers, it won't be of any benefit to early emerging species or for queens that just woke up from hibernation. So early spring is a very sensitive and crucial time for queen bumblebees. And therefore we want to see a season long bloom to include early spring flowers. And of course, this is also great for you because your pollinator garden will always have something for you to admire. We also look for different colors, shapes, and sizes. Purple in particular is very attractive to bees, though I'm not entirely sure why. And of course we advocate for planting uh, native species over ornamental ones. The ornamental species that we plant, we plant more so for aesthetics reasons over any meaningful ecological reasons. And if you're curious about what plant specifically, you can find some inspiration on this poster found on our Bumblebee resources page. Again, it's free to view and download. It gives some great examples of flowers to plant that'll help you achieve a season long bloom. This one's tailored specifically to the critically endangered rusty patch bumblebee. But again, by planting these bees, you'll be helping, or planting these flowers, sorry, you'll be helping bumblebees in general and other native bees. The last thing we could do is to help house the bees. So we have the capacity to help house the bees very easily in our yard, similar to what Monica talked about, about um, reintroducing woody debris into lakes for fish to use. People want to take those out for aesthetics reasons. People also want to remove parts of their yard that might be uh, logs or rocks or whatever for aesthetics reasons. But in reality, those features of your yard can be used for bumblebees. So we want to resist perfection. In the bee world, an unruly yard is the perfect yard. 
So we might want to consider leaving the leaves, maybe mowing less or converting to native grasses or flowers. And again, like I mentioned, leaving parts of your yard undisturbed and bumblebees will make it their home. Anything that's well-drained and sh uh, shady can be used for overwintering and nesting sites. And these features particularly can include empty rodent burrows. So if you know you've had rabbits or mice in your yards, bumblebees can make use of that. Decaying logs and trees, another thing that people like to remove for aesthetics purposes. Thatchy vegetation, you might be tempted to mow back, but that again can be used for a nesting site. And also rock piles, again, resist the urge to remove those from your yards if you can, because bees can make it their home. And when I talk here about leaving parts of your yard or property undisturbed, the reasoning for that is similar to what I had described with regards to pollinator gardens. So especially in more urbanized and fragmented settings, adequate nesting and overwintering spots become fewer and farther between. So having these naturalized or undisturbed areas, even small ones, helps the populations maintain themselves and helps bees access other necessary habitat features more easily. So for example, um, if you have more of these nesting features throughout the landscape, they might not have to fly so far to find flowers and they might not have as much competition for these nesting and overwintering spots. So with this, instead of us providing them with a truck stop, we're basically providing them with real estate. So to summarize what you can do to help the bees, you can consider being involved in community science or by participating in Bumblebee Watch in general, uh, you can do what you can to feed the bees with your pollinator garden. You can do what you can around your property to help house the bees. And of course, now that you're equipped with all this knowledge, you can now go forth and spread awareness of these helpful actions, which I hope you all will. That about wraps it up for me. That's all I have today. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for joining. I'd like to thank Watersheds Canada again for hosting and to our partners and funders. Please uh, reach out via email, pollinators at wildlifepreservation.ca if you have any questions. Uh, please check out our website, wildlifepreservation.ca, and our social medias if you're into it. The handles are here. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions that we have time for. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cole. A lot of the different resources that Cole has mentioned today will be summarized in a handout that everyone will get to their inbox as well as the recording from today's session. So you can expect both of those things next week. Nicole is going to just quickly drop in the chat a short survey that people, if you could just take like literally two minutes to let Cole and I know how we did today. If you have any questions about what was covered or if you have ideas for future webinars and speakers, that would be very helpful for us as we look ahead, especially to the fall webinar series. But we will go into some questions. So the first one people are asking about urban spaces. So if they don't have a lot of areas where they can plant, is there anything specific that they could do, maybe like nest structures or are there other things that they can look at trying to do to help pollinators if they don't have a large lawn where they can plant? Yeah. Um, like I said, with the pollinator gardens, they don't have to be super large. They can be as small as just one window box or, you, or just like um, those regular small planters that you might be able to put in your windowsill or around your property in general. Um, like I said, I think of them as truck stops. So in that regard, they don't have to be a huge like field or your whole yard. They could just be a handful of flowers uh, that bees can kind of use as a pit stop. Um, with habitat structures, I see a lot of people um, trying to use like bee hotels and, and stuff like that. I try to lean away from that. Um, like I said, if, uh, if there's, things going on in your yard like leaves have been falling off your trees or there's like rotting logs or some rocks around um to help the bees i would just leave them there if you can if they're there um a lot of people they might not have the privilege of having their own yard to manage people live in their uh like condos and, and apartments and stuff like that not, not everybody's a homeowner so that is kind of more skewed to home ownership unfortunately um but if you do have any part, anything sort of a yard, again, that would be my, my recommendation would just be to leave some of the natural features of your yard there. Okay, perfect. And you had mentioned in the presentation, some of the community science initiatives and the train the trainer. So someone was just asking if you knew of other citizen science apps that would be helpful or if the best one would be the Bumblebee Watch. 
Yeah, uh, I always advocate for Bumblebee Watch because that is specific to what we're working with. And it's also um, a platform where you're guaranteed to have a Bumblebee expert verify that data. Um, but again, you can also submit your Bumblebee observations to something like iNaturalist. That is probably the biggest community science program out there in North America. Uh, that's the only one I can think of other than Bumblebee Watch. But Bumblebee Watch, again, it's what we use to assess um, the success of things like our citizen science programs and also to uh, just congregate Bumblebee data without having to filter out everything else as well. Okay, the next question is topical. So we're going into springtime and someone's commenting that they leave their leaves on their property until late spring, but they notice their neighbors are, you know, t tidying up their lawn. Mm -hmm. And they're wondering how you have those conversations with, you know, your community about why it's important to leave the lawn as is. Do you have any resources or conversation starters that have worked well for you? Hmm, that's tricky. I personally don't have any resources on that, but I would imagine starting a confrontation or just initiating it might not go over so well, as opposed to just leaving it yourself. And then if they're curious as to why you're not tidying up your yard, then you can elaborate and say, well, these are actually uh, useful habitat sources for bumblebees. And maybe you should also consider following suit. People aren't very receptive if you just um, go to them and try and advocate for something that they that they might not be aware of. So uh, if you let the natural curiosity build, they might come to you first. And that often uh, is a much more pleasant interaction. Someone's curious about the spelling of bees. So sometimes they see bumble bee and sometimes they mm -hmm. see bumble bee and they're wondering if one of them is correct or what's going on, why the words are sometimes separated. I'm not sure why they're separated. Whenever I am, like, we all use in the uh, B community, we just separate Bumble and B. Um, but for some reason, when I'm typing in, like, Word or PowerPoint, it always wants to autocorrect to the conjoined version. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, we all on our team and all of our collaborators in the B worlds, we separate. I'm not too sure on the linguistics behind it. That's Okay. Next person is wondering the best ways that people can reduce and prevent the use of pesticides by large users. So thinking like the agriculture or the greenhouses you were talking about, have you mm -hmm. had those types of conversations on how people can maybe advocate for change beyond their own property? Yeah, that's tricky because um, that's all guided through um, government regulations. But really the one thing that comes to mind would be petitioning. Um, just having your own voice and throwing your, yourself out singularly often doesn't work. Uh, but if you have a bunch, the backing of a bunch of other people, that might give you some more leverage. So um, if it's something you want to do, you could consider petitioning with other like-minded people and then putting that forth to your regulators around the particular area that you're concerned with. So if it's something very local, you can bring it forth to your local uh, representatives with a bunch of signatures of your, of your like-minded folks. And that would be my logical first step, really. Okay, the next question is about the bees you mentioned coming from Sudbury down to Southern Ontario. So someone's curious how you transport them, if you need volunteers to help with that transportation, or is there like a WPC van that takes them? How does that transportation work? Um, in the past, we've tried to use volunteers but it's pretty tricky to coordinate because our Sudbury field team and our field team in Guelph, they're all very busy and we kind of schedule them uh, on a short-term basis based on how many Queens they have and what's the weather like. If it's sunny out, they're not going to spend the day driving. They're going to be out surveying. So we've tried uh, something called bees on board, which is a volunteer initiative. It wasn't too successful. We only had one person <laughs> sign up and help, but uh, so really what it, what we would end up doing is somebody from our org, um, would drive out to like Perry Sound and meet our, our Northern field team and exchange the bees and then shuttle them back to um, Cambridge. So we don't have a van. <laughs> uh, we tried volunteers. We're still working on the volunteer aspect of that. Um, but right now it's mostly just our own teams driving back and forth. I was picturing like a really nice bee branded van. <laughs> that could be in the future. <laughs> 
someone hope. someone's asking about their specific property so they see a lot of mm. carpenter bees and they're wondering if those are more dominant or if it's just a reflection of their yard and that it is a more suitable habitat for those bees yeah that's um could be a different things a couple of different things going on carpenter bees are very interesting they um i mean we might be seeing a lot more of carpenter bees than are actually represented of the other kinds of bees around because carpenter bees are very territorial and aggressive, particularly the males. So male carpenter bees, they're the ones that will chase you around. Like if you're near their nest, they will come out and try and scare you away. They can't sting you. So it's all just a bluff, but you might just be seeing more carpenter bees because they are trying to scare you off as opposed to you actually have more carpenter bees on your property than any other kind of bee. Um, so if you do have a naturalized yard, you can expect to have carpenter bees. Um, and people also, they complain about bees trying to get into their wood. If you are uh, trying to avoid that, you can leave like dummy logs out, like drill some holes in a, in a log yourself and leave that out as a, like go for that and not my actual, not my deck, you know, or my, or my shed. Uh, but again, if you're seeing a lot of carpenters, it might just be more of a reflection of their um, their behaviors as opposed to the actual um, different kinds of bees present in your yard. Okay, the next question is about rock piles. People are wondering how large of a rock pile is helpful for the bees. How large of a rock pile? Um, that would, it can vary. Um, if you're trying to make your own rock pile, you might want to lay it in the ground some and make sure it's nice and shaded. But uh, bumblebees, they can make uh, a house out of any size hole, really. Um, it's hard to say. I don't know. I'm not, um, I haven't really had much experience designing um, bumblebee habitat from scratch. But if you just have something there that's in a nice, well drained soil, it's kind of in the ground some more with nice shade around it, maybe surrounded by some tufted grass. That would be ideal. Near the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about how introduced species can outcompete our native species. And so someone's wondering about the impact of honeybees on bumblebees specifically, if their honeybees are contributing to their decline at all, or if they outcompete them. Mm -hmm. This is a very contentious topic in the bee world. Um, people butt heads about this. There is evidence in the literature to suggest that when honeybees are present, uh, bumblebees are less successful at foraging. So they are competing with bumblebees in naturalized settings. And then also, um, if you recall back when I was discussing pathogen spillover from agricultural settings, this, some of these same parasites that we're concerned with in bumblebees are also present in honeybees. So the same way um, those honeybees can escape the agricultural setting and then spill those pathogens over into the uh, native wild bees. So um, it might not be what some people like to hear, but the short answer is yes. Okay, the next one is going back to the transportation of the bees from Sudbury. So someone is wondering if music is being played in the vehicle, if it affects their fitness. <laughs> um, we haven't really considered that. We do say, you know, have your music pretty low. We have them in like coolers when we're transporting them. So they're in the, they're in little vials uh, with some uh, cotton soaked nectar at the bottom. The, the vials have holes in them so they can go down and uh, stick their tongues out and drink the, drink the nectar. Um, they also have, we also put little structures in the vials for them to hang on to, but then we just put them in a nice cooler, closed, nice and cozy and dark. Um, but uh, we haven't really been measuring the effects of music. No, we just say, you know, keep it, keep it pretty quiet. The next question, I think you had a handout that showed different plant species that you recommended. So someone's just wondering if you can go back to that, presumably yes. to take a screenshot. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh, here it is. Yes, the web page that you can find this on is right here, uh, bumblebee or sorry, wildlifepreservation.ca slash bumblebee resources. There's a few others as well, including some ID cards, but you can find this one at the bottom of that page. It's also just very pretty to look at. So, awesome. And then our last question here we have from a teacher. So, she's wondering how she can help her students 
help bumblebees. So she's heard that the bee hotels are not effective and they attract more wasps and bees and they can also be riddled with parasites. So she's wondering what sorts of activities or, you know, outreach she could do with the kids to actually help the bees. Hmm. With kids, uh, one thing we do, we kind of do like a uh, altered version of our community science programs in some of the other outreach uh, events that we do. So we'll teach kids um, how to identify them and also how to capture them, but uh, with also with what they can do to help. A lot of the times, things like schools will reach out to us and, and ask for workshops or ask for, um, you know, just validation on their pollinator gardens. We don't really specialize in pollinator gardens, but um, we do have some useful information to help people achieve a successful pollinator garden. So if a school wants to, or a, a, any group or kids, um, like school group or things like uh, community organizations that focus on uh, young children, if they want to have their own pollinator garden that the kids are involved with designing and building, uh, that's a great thing to do. And then also just making them aware at a young age of some of these things. So they take that into their adult life and then they know how to uh, live alongside bees, so to speak, and help them in uh, the small ways like uh, in in your yard or um, just like a small flower box even. But uh, we unfortunately don't have anything laid out that we advertise specifically for kids. It's more of on a case by case basis based on what the host organization wants to achieve. Okay, perfect. And I will throw in that Watersheds Canada does have a number of native plant resources. So if people are looking mm -hmm. to do like shoreline restorations or wildflower gardens as well, we'll be sure to link out both organizations resources in that handout for everyone. And again, that'll come out next week with the recording from today's session as well. So feel free to share those far and wide so that lots of people are able to take action this spring and help out uh, Wildlife Preservation Canada and all of their amazing work for our bees and other species. So thank you, Cole, very much for your great presentation today. Really visually, uh, it was a nice visual presentation, like following along with you and learning about the bees. I learned a lot of things that I did not know about bees. So I can imagine that's the same for a lot of people on the call. And just really thankful for you taking the time to share your knowledge and different ways that people can take action. Yeah. Thanks for hosting. Thank you again, everybody for coming. Awesome. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.